Hello everyone and welcome to Stories on the Rooftop. My name is Aliza Mitter, team, members for, team member for Stories on the Rooftop, which is part of the Art and Culture portfolio of the Aga Khan Youth and Sports Board. I'm delighted that Faridun Hemani will be our speaker today and will take us through his experience over the past four decades in journalism, covering key events and people that shaped his career and the lessons he learned along the way. As we will be discussing issues around conflict, we will be showing some video footage which may be unsuitable for younger members of the audience. To give you a bit of background, Faridun began his career in the 1970s in Canada in local television. He then went on to international news coverage and covered many of the big stories of the 80s and 90s worldwide for American TV news networks, CNN, ABC, ABC, CNN, sorry, NBC, ABC and worldwide television news. 20 years ago, he went independent and co-founded Lynx Productions with Natasha Radanovich, and since then has focused on social projects, working with several UN agencies and mainly with the Aga Khan Development Network. So welcome Faridun and thanks for joining us today. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here and very honored because I've seen the list of people that you've had in the past, astronauts, Bollywood uh, stars, uh, rally drivers, documentary makers, so I'm really happy that I'm here and able to share my stories. Um, so firstly, um, how did you get into broadcast journalism? Well, I never um, ever, ever thought that I'd get into journalism. I'm, like I say, an accidental journalist. My grandfather, when he was, uh, when I was in Kenya very young, I know he was very interested in news. In the morning, at six o'clock in the morning, he would listen in Kenya, listen to BBC, Voice of America, Radio South Africa, All India Radio, Radio Pakistan, etc. And by seven o'clock, people would start calling him and getting the news. So news was in my blood for sure, but I never thought that would be my career. I thought I was heading the way uh, business administration or law or something like that. So when I was in Vancouver, um, I decided to take a look what was available in business administration and financial management and so on. I went to BCIT and got the calendar prospectus as it's known here. And I looked at business administration and I turned the page backwards by chance. And that was broadcast technology. When I saw broadcast technology, broadcast radio, TV journalism, when I saw broadcast journalism, something in my, in my head, in my heart said, this is it, I, I, this is what I want to do. So that's how I decided to go into journalism. But I, I could not get in that year. So I came back to England for a year where my parents were. But my parents were not very happy at all. My father did not think that this was a real job. It was not a real profession. It was, you know, he was hoping that I'd be a lawyer or a businessman or I don't know what. If it wasn't an office job in a suit and tie job, then I was not in the right profession. My mother was opposed to it for different reasons, because she said, I know you, the moment you go into journalism, you're going to go into the war zones. And I said, mom, how is that going to happen? You know, because I'm going to Vancouver. There's no war in Vancouver. There's financial journalism. There is, I don't know, local council, there's education and so on. So she actually made me promise that she, you know, that I, I can go and get my journalism and all that, that I will not ever go into the war zones. So I did go to Vancouver and I went to BCIT and the first day that I went in and I learned about microphones and interviewing and all that, I knew I had found it. I just one of those lucky people that I knew that this is what I want to do all my life. My instructors were not very sure about that because Canada's television landscape was very, very, very different to what it is now. In Canada, it was a, you had to have the right voice, not necessarily the right color, but the right accent, the right everything. And on-air presentation was 40% of the market BCIT. And I did not graduate from BCIT because, because I did not pass the on-air test. I had the wrong voice, the wrong accent, the wrong whatever. Fortunately for me, um, it, it worked out because uh, a television station called CKVU television that needed, um, that had a mandate from the government, new mandate to create an hour's worth of news. And so they needed people and they had no choice but to take me in. But CKVU was like a family. And there you see, if you can see the picture, uh, that's a typewriter for the generation that doesn't know what a typewriter is. And this was a modern, a modern typewriter because until then it was all manual typewriter, not, not, uh, not, not electric. But anyway, so CKVU is where I ended up working in local television. So then how did you get into uh, going abroad to cover international news? Well, my dream job came to an end a couple of years later when I, was, when I lost my job. The company thought, um, I, I thought I'd been unfairly laid off. 
the company thought they were laying me off because of financial cuts, so it had to go into arbitration. And while it was in arbitration, I looked around and I thought there were no job prospects for me, uh, especially not having graduated from BCIT. And I looked at what was happening in Iran, in the Middle East, in all sorts of places like that. There had been a revolution in Iran. There had been a hostage-taking crisis. There was the Iran-Iraq war. And I decided that that's what I wanted to do while I figure out the, the legalities of having lost my job or not, or whatever it is. In the end, they, they, they were found guilty and I, they re-offered me the job. And, Money, but I but I decided to to go away to Iran anyway. But the problem was, of course, I'd made a promise that I would not go and venture into into war zones. So how do I get out of it? Because my mother is a very tough woman. So my grandfather, my maternal grandfather, the same newsman, he was he was a very wise man, and he said, "Why don't you write to Prince Azruddin? He is a former High Commissioner for Refugees. He is." Uh, He's a man of the world, he knows, so why don't you get his advice? So I said, okay. So I wrote to Prince Azuddin Aga Khan and said, this is a problem I'm having and I'd really like to go in Iran, et cetera, et cetera. And I think within a couple of weeks, I got a response back to say, well, I cannot really decide one way or the other between you and your mother. However, if you choose to take this assignment, then I think it'll be very exciting. So with that kind of out, I managed to convince my mother that it was okay and I wasn't breaking my promise and I ended up going abroad. But I never made it to Iran. I got no visas, but I did go to Kenya because there were a few uh, uh, conferences taking place. And as it turns out, I met Prince Azruddin there. He was there for the UN Energy for uh, Renew and Renewable Sources of Energy. We met and he remembered me, of course, and I had an interview with him for an Ismaili publication and for radio. And that is how I started my international career. And then it got better. Um, after Kenya, after I spent all my money and sold my clothes to live there longer and longer, finally I had to leave Kenya. And I went to, with my friend Richard, um, we went to Cairo. On the way to London, we thought we'd spend a couple of weeks in Cairo. And by chance, we arrived there the night before Sadat was shot dead. President Sadat in October 6, 1981. And that changed my career. So I knocked on doors looking for jobs. Nobody would give me a job. I had a letter to deliver to CNN at the time. And CNN was one year old. Nobody had heard of CNN at the time. In fact, the other networks were so arrogant in, in those terms that they, they said CNN stood for chicken noodle news. They would not take it seriously. And so I went to CNN and I delivered the letter. I asked if they need jobs going. They said, yeah, we need a sound man. I said, I'm your guy. And I said, okay. And I'd never done sound before, except when I was at BCIT and maybe a couple of days of learning how to use a camera. But I leveled with them later and told them, look, I'm not a sound engineer, but I can record your basic interviews, et cetera, et cetera. And I said, it was okay. And that's how I got my in into an international company. So a bit of being in the right place at the right time and a bit of good timing um, uh, was on your side. But in addition to that, you had some guardian angels that also uh, came to your rescue. All my professional life and even in my personal life to a certain extent, I've had guardian angels. I feel very, very blessed that way. In so many ways, when I feel like I've come to the end of the road, and then all of a sudden, something, somebody will come into my life. So in this case, as I took on the CNN job, we were sent with Dick Blystone, who was a senior uh, foreign correspondent, international correspondent at CNN, an amazing guy, one of the best writers in television, and he took me under his wing. So with him, and an Egyptian crew, we went to Sudan on our way to the Chad border because Libya was bombing Sudan at the time because they were supporting the rebel leader in Chad. It's a long convoluted story, but because we were CNN and we were not um, ABC or CBS or NBC, they got to go by government helicopters. We had to go by like Land Rovers and drive for 14 hours and then another place and then come back 26 hours driving. You know, What looks on the map like a three lane highway is actually a dirt road. And on the way back from after interviewing us in Harbury, we got lost in the middle of the night completely, totally. And Dick Blystone even looked at the stars at night and, and tried to find our way and nothing. And we didn't know what to do. And out of the blue, this one person shows up, an elderly man. And he understood we were lost. And he says, I know the way, I know where you're going. So he hopped on the back of one of our Land Rovers, took us six, seven kilometers to the road. He says, now, now you can go, just go that way. And we offered to take him back. And he says, you'll never find your way back. We offered him money. And he says, I didn't do it for money. We offered him a flashlight or torch to say, um, just take that. He says, no, I'm from here. I didn't do any of this for money or whatever. You just 
take that road and, and you'll be home. And of course, we found our way. We go to a village in the early morning. They treated us like kings, even though they're very poor. And we go to Khartoum and Cairo, and we were actually able to feed our material even before ABC News did. So, so that guardian angel popped in. So then I was back in Cairo. I'd spent some weeks there. Work had run out. Uh, again, I was out of money. I was hiding from landlords. Uh, I was eating like like 10 cent meals. And if on a good day, if something had happened, when I had earned some money, then a 25 cent shawarma sandwich would, would be the one that, that I would eat. But at that time, um, in June uh, of 82, uh, Israel invaded Lebanon. And CNN remotely said, look, if you want to work with us in Beirut, you've got to make yourself, you've got to get yourself to Amman, Jordan, and we'll pick you up from there. And I had no money. So then it was time for calling on guardian angels. So two in the name, the name of Brian Harrop and Elaine Miles, who I just met only a few months ago. I called them and said, look, Brian, I, I need money. How much do you need? $600. He said, okay, take it. And I was so pleased because I, there was nobody else I could turn to. And so then ABC, NBC, CBS, they gave me gear and money and all that to hand over to their staff. I get to Amman, deliver, distribute all the stuff. And then I run out of money again because the Syrians messed up my passport, my visa. Amman was a very, very expensive city at the time. And here suddenly three days in, I had no money. I was in debt for $600 and I was booking my flight back to Cairo. And Guardian Angel number X, Ahmed Sharif, NBC editor, he realized I was in trouble and he's gave me access to his room, to his telex, to everything, coached me on how to get the job at, um, at NBC and substitute with another uh, uh, sound man who did not want to go to Beirut, and I did. And that's how I then got a job at NBC, which eventually led to a job for six or seven years with ABC News in London as a foreign editor. But that's all thanks to people who came at the right time to give me that push, not because of my smartness. I'm sure it's partly to do with your smartness. Um, so you spent six years, uh, you said, with, with ABC News uh, covering the, the Middle East and Lebanon. There must be some interesting stories uh, from, from that period as well. There were plenty. Those were my, my growing years. And I felt so privileged to be working for a big international organization. This is the time when, when money was no object. For example, the, uh, the biggest story at the time was Lebanon, Beirut, civil war, hostage taking. There was a TW hijacking in 1985, where we were spending something like 42 or $43,000 a day on that story, because it was so big, it was, uh, and, and there were, technology was not there, and the earth stations to transmit by satellite had been bombed. So there were two charters to Cyprus, we had a whole team in Cyprus, we had a team in Damascus, cars would come to Damascus, we would, it was just like a mega, mega operation, and some very successful, very Charlie Glass was the correspondent, Julie Flint and a lot of Lebanese people who were good contacts and a good, good story to, to, to do. And there's so many stories behind the story about how we managed to scoop everybody, but that's for another time. And then the other stories that were exciting were like, um, this is Gandhi's funeral and she was assassinated. And suddenly we get a call at six in the morning and I go to the airport and we're trying to get seven people on flights that are full. And my job was just to, to try and get all these people on. So I would go to every single passenger in first class on that flight and say, look, do you not know their rights? Mrs. Gandhi has been killed. You don't want to go to Delhi? No. They come off and we take one seat, two seats, three seats, and we got seven people um, on the plane. Um, Zia ul Haq's funeral in Pakistan, the Gulf War, Kuwait. They were quite, those were my growing up years, you know, so. So in the Gulf War of 1991, you were caught out in a bit of an unfortunate uh, or tricky situation, let's say. Um, what was that about? Like got caught with my pants down, you mean? <laughs> well, by this time I was with, um, by this time, just before I, before I go to WTN, when I was in Kuwait for the ABC and for the Gulf War and all that, the same people who told me at ABC, my at, at, at BCIT, my instructor, that I would not make it in the business, he was then the foreign editor at CTV News and he was calling me every day. So I was actually filing stories on his request to CTV. So that somehow vindicated me that, you know, that I was right in pursuing it. But anyway, coming back to, so the Gulf War is after um, the, uh, the US and, and all the alliance uh, gave Saddam Hussein the ultimatum to withdraw from Kuwait on January 15th of 1991. And we were waiting for the bombing, we were waiting for the bombing, it didn't happen, we waited past midnight, it didn't happen. I went to bed about 12.30, thinking, okay, it's gonna to happen tomorrow. And then the next thing I know is my phone rings, a hotel phone, and it's my cameraman. 
He says, did you see, did you see? And I said, what do you mean, did you see? He says, look out of your window and I opened the curtains. I didn't even hear the, the shelling or anything at all and the sky it all lit up completely and I slept through it. And we had made plans, the office room was literally directly across my, 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 my own room. We had made plans for everything and he said, I'm coming up to get the camera. And I said, okay. And I quickly thought, let me get the camera ready. I left my room to go to the office and my room door closed and I was in my underclothes. And now what do I do? And there's suddenly anti-aircraft fire. There is nobody wants to come to the 14th floor is where we were at the top floor. I get the camera and then I, now I'm faced with having to go down to the reception area in my underwear and asking somebody to find me a key to open my room. <laughs> and I had a bit of a fight with the, with the porter there and somehow eventually he came and managed. But by this time, the Iraqi authorities had started rounding up the journeys and putting them in the basement because they didn't want that side of the story to come that they were being attacked and there was damage being done. You know? um, and so I climbed down the 14 steps and shot along the way and we sent the takes out to, to Amman. To defend, yeah. However, um, while that was the unfortunate incident, I, I went back and forth many times. And uh, again, Prince Azruddin comes into the picture because he was a special envoy to the UN uh, Secretary General for, the, for this war. So I interviewed him in Amman at one point, and then when I was back in Baghdad, uh, we interacted quite a bit. Uh, he had press conferences and conversations and meetings and all the rest of it. But for the Ismaili audience, uh, the viewers here, what's interesting is that uh, there was Eid fell on one of those days that we were both in Baghdad at the same time. And for Eid, we exchanged, I gave him a, a tasbih because I knew that he liked certain tasbihs and that's what I could get in the hotel. There was, there was no choice really to go out. And he was so pleased with it that he said, now that we're exchanging gifts, he took out his tasbih and gave it to me and says, here, keep this for good luck. And it was very, very good because after that, I'd been in so many dicey situations and the tasbih stayed with me until all that time. Even my cameraman, a Mexican cameraman in, from WTN, if the tasbih was not with me in Bosnia and Yugoslavia story, he would not even sit in the car with me. He says, find it and make sure it's there because that was a lucky thing. Sadly, I lost it about 10 years ago, but I figure somebody else needed the luck more than I did. Wow, well, what a great story. And, and speaking of, uh, uh, of you know, the, the life-threatening situations that, that you faced, I think a lot of them came in, in Yugoslavia. Um, so tell us a little bit about that. Well, that was one of the most uh, dangerous situations, uh, I think. Um, Beirut had been dangerous, uh, other wars have been dangerous and all that, but here journalists were targets. And this is the first time where, and there was complete, it, it was chaos in so many ways. An early story that I can remember is I was in a town called Shid in Serbia, which was very near the Croatian city of Vukovar, which was under siege. In fact, today is the anniversary that Vukovar siege was lifted. And I, we, ran, we came across this drunken Montenegrin soldiers and we stopped and one of them just picked on us and he said, follow me, not follow me, come with me. And he got me to put my hands up and he had his gun and, and just prodded me from the back. And he spoke no English, I spoke no Serbian or you know, Serbo-Croatian at the time as he was called. And he just walked me to the back in the car park. And when he did that, people were cheering him on because he, because it had reports that there were Kurdish mercenaries fighting on the Croatian side and he was convinced I was a Kurdish mercenary. So with this gun in the back with no communication and him completely drunk anyway, we managed to get to, um, to the back and there were people cheering him to shoot him, shoot him, shoot him. And my other crew was held by other people elsewhere. And then I tried to tell him, look, I'm Canadian, you know, like take me to the car and I'll show you my papers. And suddenly an old Serbian gentleman, guardian angel, he spoke English and he says, you're Canadian. I said, yes. He says, oh, look, I'm Australian. I said, you speak English? He says, yes. I said, well, show, tell this guy to take me back to the car and I'll show him my papers. And, and somehow he convinced him to not kill me and bring me back to the car. And while the guy did not believe me during that time, the Serbian police came and they saved us from this crowd and, and the rest did us. But that was only the beginning. The, Real trouble came in, in Bosnia where, where it was so dangerous that um, people like Martin Bell of the BBC and other very enlightened correspondents, they decided that there was no point in us risking, all of us risking our lives in the one point. 
So we pooled our material. We would all shoot in different places. We pooled our material and that's how dangerous it was. And for the first time, journalists were having to go around in armored cars, which was quite, um, quite something else. So to, sh to give you an idea of uh, what reporting like there was, and this is before Christian Amanpour got there and the satellite dishes came and all that, take a look at this report. The city of Sarajevo is under a cloud of smoke as buildings burn and militiamen fight machine gun battles in the streets. For 16 hours, Serbian units used heavy artillery to bombard the besieged city from surrounding hills, and today, Muslims launched an attack to drive the Serbs from those hills. There are reports of dozens dead and hundreds wounded in the fighting over the past few days. Doctors are appealing for more blood they, and say they're running low on what medical supplies they do have left. The United Nations Security Council, meanwhile, is considering a plan to send more than a thousand more peacekeepers to Yugoslavia. They would oversee an operation to reopen the Sarajevo airport to get emergency supplies into the city. Well, joining us now from Sarajevo is Faradun Hamani, a worldwide television news producer. Mr. Hamani, can you hear me all right? Yes, uh, I can. You're a little low, but I can't hear you. Go all right. ahead. All right, I'll speak slowly and, and tell me if you need me to repeat the question and I will do that. First of all, perhaps you can describe for us what is happening on the ground right now regarding the hostilities, the fighting. Well, uh, we've been under fire now for about two days. Uh, there have been some very, very heavy shelling. It has probably been the heaviest uh, shelling so far. The difference this time is that uh, the Bosnians uh, have been actually responding uh, to the firing from the hills. On Friday, the, uh, the barracks, the Federal Army barracks were evacuated, and the Bosnians got their hands on all the heavy weapons that were in there, and it is these weapons they were actually responding with. So they started their offensive this morning, and we've had continuous shelling, mortars, and even machine gun fire for the past, uh, certainly for the past 30 hours, it's been inside. Mr. Hamani, how serious is the food situation in Sarajevo now? Well, in Sarajevo, generally, it is pretty bad. In the town center where I am, people are making do with bread and simple food, and they can cope right now because I guess they were expecting it, but there are some suburbs, such, uh, a particularly a place called Dobrinia and other little villages around that have been under siege now for about two months, and there's been no way that any food or any supplies or any medicine has gotten through. Previous attempts to get food into these areas have resulted in, in tragic uh, endings, basically, where, where even some of the drivers of the UNHCR and other relief agencies have been killed. So that was the early days of Sarajevo before all the journeys got in and very, very few people um, were reporting from there. Um, then things got even worse because we became targets and there was bounties on journeys' heads. And the next clip we'll show you is a report done by Entertainment Tonight because at the, after the death of an ABC producer, and with that clip, it'll give you an idea of, of what it was like to cover that story. Covering wars and revolutions is a dangerous assignment, of course, and one with very high costs. Here's today's Inside Story. We're in the middle of this guy. Vietnam, 45 journalists killed over 15 years. El Salvador, 40 dead in 10 years of fighting. But in what was Yugoslavia in the last 14 months alone, no fewer than 30 journalists have already died in what has become the most dangerous war newsmen and women have ever faced. The most recent was Sam Donaldson's longtime ABC News producer David Kaplan, who was killed by a sniper's bullet one week ago. His death served to point out that unlike other wars, the press is fair game in Yugoslavia. Veterans of the news business say this marks a turning point. There is no sanctuary. Journalists can generally find sanctuary. They can get behind lines and, and feel reasonably secure. They know where the incoming is. Uh, in this case, it's all sniper activity, and uh, apparently both sides hate the journalists. It isn't easy, and nobody does it very well. And I am thinking of, of David Kaplan and what happened to him. And, you know, I just can't get it out of my mind. <laughs> For journalists covering the fighting, the knowledge that they're being targeted brings a certain sense of resignation, says CNN's Chris Turner. Just returned from Bosnia, he says working there is like having a bullseye painted on your back. You will be shot at your first or your second day, and there's no question. You don't, it's not if you'll be, it's when you'll be shot at. At one point, you'll be in the crosshairs of a gun, and someone's going to open fire on you and try and kill you just because you're a journalist. 
Faradun Hamani, seen here in Sarajevo, is a bureau chief for international news organization WTN. He says he's even heard that a $500 bounty is being offered to any soldier who can kill a member of the press. He had a close call of his own, he says, when he was picked up by soldiers for what proved to be a mock execution. They were screaming at us in a language we didn't understand. They put us up against a wall and walked us about 50 yards, and we had our hands up, and finally, after about two minutes, which seemed like two hours, I said, okay, you can go. But that, the feeling of that, this is the end. I, I made my peace with God. The kind of danger that journalists are facing in Yugoslavia is not lost on their colleagues working in newsrooms back home. CNN's Eason Jordan, who's responsible for assigning crews and reporters to their stories, has already seen camerawoman Margaret Moth and correspondent Mark Dulmage wounded by sniper fire in Sarajevo. It's a tremendous weight on our shoulders. We would prefer that there not be a story and that we not have to send people there. It has caused many sleepless nights and I'm sure will cause many more sleepless nights. While no journalist goes into harm's way without first agreeing to do so, the risk in Yugoslavia is all too evident. Even so, those who have been there say it is all part of the job. I used to work in London, and there was nothing worse for me than, than sitting behind the desk and watching on the satellite all this material coming in when I feel that I should be there myself. Where did the hair go? <laughs> so that was the conditions, uh, and the mock execution I referred to is... is um, we were about to go on a story with our Bosnian Muslim producer, Victor Nikolaitis, our cameraman, at nine o'clock at night, and all of a sudden we were ambushed by a, two or three people. Threw us out of the cars on the ground, hands on the ground, head down, with the guns pointing to the back. And they kept shouting at us in a language we didn't understand. If you got up, they said, we'll kill you. If you got down, this will kill you. This went on and on and on. And then eventually they lined us up against the wall. They kept asking more questions. And then they decided that, again, like in the incident in Sheed, they would, um, they would walk us about 50, 50 yards or so. It was pitch black, it was dark in the car park. And it was screaming all the time, walk fast, walk fast. If you walk fast, they said, go slow, go slow, we'll kill you. So the threat and the loud, uh, angry, angry, angry voices, you know. So we got about 50 yards, we had our hands up. And then he says, okay, stop, we stopped. And then you could hear the of the gun. So at that point, it was like, okay, now there's nothing to save me. This is it. So basically, that was time for prayer because if nobody had saved you so far, nobody's going to come now. And then amazingly, there's silence. Nothing happens. And then he says, you can put your hands down. And we put our hands down, and suddenly a car with screeching tires came. They jumped in the car, and they went away. So I think what it was, was it was a warning. It was a bunch of uh, Serbian men who were trying to tell and give an, um, a message to the Muslim uh, Bosnian population that we, it was area was very Muslim, Dobrinia, and that we can come. There's nothing you can do. We can come, we can do what we want. So that's what happened. So eventually I stayed on in Sarajevo for a little longer. Then it got worse and worse and my reactions were getting worse. And while I reported for CNN, there's, the stories were coming back. Of course, you could watch it in Bosnia and in Serbia, in the Serbian part, you know. So the Bosnian Serbs called my cameraman and said, we don't want your boss to be reporting. We know he's Muslim. We know he's a spy for the Muslim president, Izzet Begovic. And if he doesn't stop, we'll kill him. And there was no airport in Sarajevo. There was no other way out to leave Sarajevo because he was under siege except to Serbian lines. And they said, when he comes out, we'll be waiting for him. So WTN stopped me from reporting uh, on CNN. Um, and then I was getting like, like I needed to get out. There's no way out safely. So I went to the Canadian general, Louis Mackenzie. He was the, the UN's general re responsible for Sarajevo. And I knew him because I'd done reports with him and interviews with him and all that. And I said, General, look, I need your help. And he says, what do you need? I said, I need to be evacuated. I am Canadian and you, you're a Canadian, Canadian Armed Forces. I need to be evacuated out of Sarajevo. And he says, no, I can't do that. He says, I can't do that because you have to be wounded in for me to, and you're not a soldier, you're either a soldier or wounded. So I said, General, you have my permission. Why don't you punch my nose, break it, then I'll be wounded, then I'll be legally, you can take me out. He laughed. He says, I'll try and see what I can do. But the Serbs were very, um, not very keen on even getting me out to Belgrade. So he decided to help me out after all. And he bundled me into an armored 
a personnel carrier with flag jackets, with everything, and got me out of the Canadian troops to Belgrade. And that was my first of maybe two or three evacuations from Sarajevo. Because of the danger, I was, report, I was barred from reporting in Sarajevo uh, I, until I could resolve that kind of stuff. So there were other conflict, conflicts happening around the world. So from the frying pan into the fire, off I go to Somalia, an operation set up by my friend Chris Laney at WTN which was like a Mad Max kind of territory. I, I don't even know how to explain that. And there are plenty of stories there where I can tell you where it just nothing made sense. And, and anyway, so Somalia was the next one. And then a good, good, good story that I felt very proud to be at and very happy to be at was uh, Nelson Mandela becoming president, South African elections for all these weeks. So that was at least one positive story for a while. And then later on, I, I resolved my differences, and these are stories also to be told at some point, with Radovan Karadzic, the Bosnian Serb leader, Radko Mladic, the military leader, so that I could actually go back and cover Sarajevo and Bosnia without, without fear. And then eventually I went back to Sarajevo, and this is what happened. It's his face, it's me. Bang, it's on his way to the Okay, with the cook, with the cook. Okay. okay. Also How are they? How is the cook? Yeah, 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 yeah. There is nothing. I'm not blaming anybody until we know exactly uh, who fired this weapon. Can you get the car? Take us home, please. Can we get a car? Can you borrow your car, please? Are you okay, James? I don't know. I know. Can you see with my mind? Oh, no, okay, that's okay. That's okay. Somebody, I don't know. Somebody brought Hanna before us. This kind of weapon, an improvised rocket bomb, is totally indiscriminate. It's not accurate. It, it, it could kill hundreds, or as, as it did today, just one. Get with them, get with them, get with them, they're doing. Yes! Sonin, do you, have, you don't have the car keys at all? Are you going to a hospital? You can see the kind of confusion and 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 just this happened at like 9, 9.30 in the morning when people were just coming into work. There's two people in that clip, Margaret Moth of CNN and Miguel Gill, who would work with us as well as for APTN. They're sadly no longer with us. Uh, Margaret had been wounded earlier in Sarajevo. She still came back, but later on she had hepatitis C during a treatment and then died from cancer. An amazing lady. If you ever, ever want to... to, to, to I can't even begin to describe her, but Margaret Moth, and she was CNN. If you look up a documentary about her in CNN, you'll be really amazed. And Miguel was a humanitarian. He was a lawyer who showed up in Sarajevo wanting to help. Uh, on a, he came in a motorbike. He worked as a journalist. And whatever money he made in Sarajevo, he gave away to the needy, to the orphanages and all that. He sadly died in West Africa on assignment also. And in this confusion, you know that there was no ambulances. We just had to find our own way to the hospital. Um, I was taken to the hospital with Rialda, um, our producer, um, by Glenn Felger from Reuters. And we just, whoever just gave rides and, and, and so on, we just made it. Now, the, the, the bad thing in many ways was my, my mother found out that I was wounded by actually seeing these pictures. 
she the office could not reach her at the time and and she was in kenya so this is how she found out and my sister found out and i had no way of contacting them because i was in hospital it it, it was not a, it was not a pleasant time but um one thing that happened was after i got operated by 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 the doctors on my eye which i i'd lost vision in my right eye um a french official a french soldier came over who was also with the un and he says mr hermani we're moving you uh by helicopter to croatia tomorrow so be at the airport at six o'clock and i said what about my other five colleagues my other people because i was a bureau chief for the region what about them it says no this is not for locals it's for foreigners only now i know what he what he meant was that the serbs would not have probably allowed the bosnian muslims to go anyway without something in return but his manner was so arrogant that i said no i cannot um I cannot leave my people and go away just because I have a Canadian passport. So I decided to stay. And it was a very, very depressing time. I had Prince Azud in Stasby and I had a BBC World Service, thanks to three reporter ladies, Stacey Sullivan from Newsweek, Samantha Parr, who eventually became the UN ambassador of the US to the UN. And um, oh my goodness, uh, Emma Daly. So they would even come and visit all the people who were sick and who were wounded. And it was quite amazing that that kind of solidarity between journalists who made you feel better. And three days later, the eye doctor comes over, examines me and he says, you know, Mr. Hemani, he had no idea that the reason I turned down the evacuation, he says, you're very lucky you did not take the uh, offer of the uh, helicopter evacuation. And I said, why? He says, because the turbulence from the helicopter and the air pressure you would have for sure lost your eye so you're actually very lucky so for completely different reasons i actually um saved my eye wow what a what an intense experience uh, that must have been but around that time um i guess just before you were wounded you actually went to tajikistan um to vo to volunteer for um Mohan Hazram's first historic visit there in, in 1995 so what was that assignment like in amongst everything else yeah so that trip was historic and it's it's a one that actually is very 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 memorable because the conditions at the time in 1995 were quite something else it was still technically at war uh, there was no food there was no water there was no transport there was nothing and it, it was a tense time and and one story that I remember quite well is um, Hazrimam was in Dushanbe and he was supposed to go to Korok, to Gorno Badakhshan, where there are a lot of Ismailis. Um, but he did a mulakat, a meeting with his followers and others in Dushanbe. And because we were very busy and there was not electricity necessarily everywhere, our batteries had run down after the mulakat and we had straight to the airport. To get to Korok, you have to go through these mountains and mountain passes. And it's very, very, very weather related. You miss your slot and the weather comes in, you cannot go, you could be stranded for days. So we get to the airport, we're supposed to take off just minutes before His Highness's plane was taking off. Um, and we were scrambling, and, but we needed our batteries charged. So while we were loading the passengers and the cargo and the food and everything we're gonna take on this charter plane, I told somebody, I said, look, don't leave without me. I'm gonna go back to the terminal to get my batteries. And she said, okay. And I got the batteries, I come out, and all of a sudden I see that they had forgotten, the doors were closed, the propellers were, were in full force, and the plane was ready to take off, to taxi. And so I, I ran to the runway and just stood there and told the pilot to stop. And he's motioning to me, like, get off the runway, get off the runway. And I'm saying, no, 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 I need to be on the plane because the camera was on the plane. So I refused to actually leave the runway. And finally he gave up because they had a very, very short time uh, to, to take off. So somebody opened like the emergency door. I climb onto the shoulders of the sound men with my batteries and Vazir, uh, Shams Qasim Laka and others, they kind of grabbed me by the hands and yanked me into the plane, closed the door as it taxis off. So we get to Khorog, thankfully, uh, ahead of Azrimam's uh, plane um, and we start covering. And then there were night stories that we needed to cover like the reception and the light stand had been left behind in Dushanbe, the salmon had been left, left behind, all the other equipment had been left behind. So, uh, so without the light stand, I actually stood like this with, with a strip lighting kit and doing this with lighting so that the cameraman could actually film. It was really, really bizarre. And I'm sure everybody thought, who is this idiot, you know, with, 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 with lights. Then that night, we went to the Mulakat site where, where Hazram was going to meet all these people. 
And it was quite amazing because we found people, it was raining, it was wet, people had been walking for days because there was no transport, no fuel, no nothing. And they had not seen, remember, they had not seen an imam or anybody for a thousand years. This is the first time they're actually seeing the imam since the time of Said Nasser Khosru. So suddenly we're seeing these people walking, families hand in hand, rain. And we, we stayed and shot quite late and arrived quite early. And by five o'clock, people had arrived. There was about 50,000 people. And they'd not seen the imam, they'd nothing. They'd spent all night in the cold, no complaints, thin drop silence. It was quite an amazing sight to see. That, these are the sort of images that won't leave me because they were very, very, very special. After that, it was, um, it was the, the, the second visit, right? 90... 1998. Yeah, 1998, the thing in Tajikistan had changed completely. That time there was food, there was, there was a lot of things. There was light, there was electricity. People were celebrating as they set up the stage and the, the Darbar site and all the rest of it. But at that time, Afghanistan was still at, at war and there was unease. And because of security reasons, Hazirum could not actually go across the, the river and go into Afghanistan. So the Jamaat gathered across the, the, the river by, by Tem where Hazram addressed them and with speakers. And then we got a cameraman in a little dinghy and got him onto the other side, to the Afghan side. And, and he shot, we shot it from both sides. And that was a message of peace that Hazram was giving at the time. And again, it's hard to express in words, you know, when you see that image and it stays in your mind. So. Yeah, what an amazing experience. Um, so around that time or after that, you, you went independent with your, with your own company. And I guess instead of taking as many physical risks as you may have done, you were taking more financial or business types of risks. So tell us a little bit about that. There are quite a few chances I took. One, one or two examples are um, uh, we decided to go into the satellite news business, satellite transmissions for news. And uh, that came by accident again. Because while, while I was independent and we were, we were still, Eglamo was actually our first client that, that we, we, uh, we worked for as a production company, independent. But suddenly I got a call from Fox News uh, and somebody who had been working at WTN and Fox News said, look, Bill Clinton is going, President Clinton is going to Romania, we need a satellite truck. So I knew a contact in Budapest and I put together a package, I hired and I went to Romania. It was an analog truck. It was single path. It was like, you know, on a wing and prayer, almost literally. But the assignment worked. The assignment worked, it was successful. So we thought, oh, maybe there's something good in this. Maybe we can do something. So the next Bill Clinton trip was coming up and uh, he was going to four or five locations, two in Turkey, Romania, Slovenia, Kosovo. And I wrote to CNN. I had a contact there that I said, who's the, who's the pool producer? And they gave me the name. And I said, okay, look, we'd like to bid for, for these locations. And then two or three days later, we get a fax back, it's fax days, that uh, you've been chosen to provide four of the locations and British Telecom will do one. And I said, four locations, goodness, that's not what I had in mind. And we did not even own a satellite truck. So now what do you do? So we hired local people everywhere. We hired local trucks. We bought equipment. Now we were committed to it. We bought equipment to bring it up to the international standard. We found English speaking producers who were the faces for our company for Lynx. Um, and, and again, my, my friend Chris Lane's name keeps coming up and he was at APTN. And there were so many changes CNN made. He helped me hijack an APTN truck for Kosovo because suddenly the demands changed, you know? And it was such a successful uh, operation that that got us into the whole satellite business. From then we invested about two, three thousand, two hundred thousand pounds on buying the first satellite one. So we had this equipment and they still had to be paid off. Um, and at some point, 9-11 happens. And this time our satellite truck was in the dish, was in Macedonia covering the, the civil war there. And 9-11 happens and I'm in London by this time and I'm trying to figure out how do we make this work and nobody would insure our engineers. You know, it was very, very difficult. But we made a decision to send the dish somewhere in one of the stands and, and I picked Islamabad because it was probably safer to do that. We had no client. We had no uplinks license permission, and that was like a military authorities there. We had no hotel room. We had no customs papers, but we took a chance. The excess baggage from Macedonia and then on PIA was something like $22,000. 
And I had to make a decision at that time to say, do I spend $22,000 and get the gear? With none of this requirements we had. And I said, yes, we'll do it. I spoke to Natasha on the phone and she says, well, it's either zero for sure or minus 20 something or plus maybe a lot more. So we took that chance. And arriving in Islamabad airport, we've got this 500 kilos worth of stuff. I'm trying to take it out of customs without papers. And of course the customs officer stops me. And he, he asked me for the papers. And I said, I looked back and I saw Chris Hansen, who used to be the NBC bureau chief. And I said, look, I'm only, they use the word coolie in India and Pakistan. So like, I'm only the coolie. I'm only helping these guys. That's a boss. That's his papers, uh, his equipment. So he's got the papers. And the guy took his eyes off me to, to go to Chris. And I just, with the engineer, we just grabbed the equipment and we came out. We had no hotel room. Thanks to Chris Laney. We did get one APTN's hijack room. It was costing us $500 a night just to leave the satellite truck, satellite dish on the roof. But that was a great decision because it actually paid off in a big way. And sometimes those chances just had to be taken. Wow, <laughs> definitely big, big decisions under pressure. Um, so you've interviewed many people uh, in your career. Which are the, the most memorable ones for you? Well, there are quite a few people I have interviewed and a lot of them had to do because of my intense years in Bosnia and Herzegovina and Croatia and all that. So all the former Yugoslav leaders, including the war criminals and all that. A memorable interview was one with Yasser Arafat. Um, in Tunis, he had, he had uh, signed this public paper recognizing the state of Israel. And it was all part of the Oslo peace process, which unfortunately didn't get anywhere. But at the time, it was a really big thing. And we flew down from Geneva. We were covering the Bosnia peace talks to Tunis. And then his plane with all journalists and his entourage was leaving from Tunis to go to Washington to meet the Israeli Prime Minister, Isaac Rabin and Clinton. So I managed to get virtually the last seat. Again, a guardian angel who had a connection just somehow got me onto that plane. So I played cameraman. It was with a client of ours. So that's when I even understood how complicated a cameraman's life is to take into account the filters and the, and the focus and the audio and the, the whole thing. But I really learned the hard way. But that was quite something. And then watching Arafat getting ready, you know, he was a terrorist just three days before. And now all of a sudden he's being welcomed at Andrews Air Force Base as a statesman. And so it was quite a remarkable point in history. Unfor unfortunately, it all ended very badly and it's still a problem. But at that time, there was so much optimism that this would lead to something with that famous handshake with the Israeli Prime Minister and with Clinton. But for the Ismaili audience who are here, I think they'd be, they'd be interested in my interview that I got with Malana Hazar Imam in Cairo in 1989 during the Aga Khan Award for Architecture. We were working alongside Eglamo at the time to make the, some environmental films because in that cycle, the Grameen Bank, the microfinance, all these were, were some restoration works, were all part of the uh, award-winning projects. So um, we were making this film and in the middle of some of the shooting, I suddenly realized, I said, wait, but we don't have an interview with, with uh, Hazri Imam. And until then, I'd been thinking more as an Ismaili rather than a journalist because any other operation, any other story, we would have gone straight to the head of the organization and said, I want an interview. So I showed up at the Cairo Hotel of the Department of Communications and I said, look, um, I need an interview with, with uh, His Highness to, to Jerry Wilkinson, who was the head of the department at the time. And they looked at me and they said, oh, come on. I said, you can't be serious because you know what it takes to get a, an interview. We need to know a little bit more about you. We need to have the, your biography. We need to have your areas of questioning. And His Highness has to put us at time. It's not like he's sitting waiting for you to come and interview him. And I said, okay, the film will not um, be what it should be if I don't get it, but I'll leave it to you. And next day, amazingly, I got a call to say, come and set up because the chances are he will do the interview with you once it's finished with Egyptian TV. We went, we set up, we were in the same room as Egyptian TV. And then things were not going well in that interview. There was chaos and the correspondent had changed. So he didn't know the right questions to ask. And I could see how I'm getting a little testy. And I thought, now what? You know, I put in the interview yesterday. I'm not an architect. I know nothing about architecture. And now I'm going to ask questions about a subject I know very little about. And to a person who's probably a little bit rattled already by, by the previous interview, you know. Somehow it worked out. I welcomed him to Studio Two. He smiled. We sat down. And thankfully, the interview went well. I had to push him a little bit because he did not want to comment on Prince Charles's comments on 
modern architecture and all that directly. So we had to find a work way around so that I still get a sound bite. Um, and it worked very well. And, and we dealt with a lot of issues that he was going to be talking about anyway. You know. Then um, um, after the interview was done, uh, I had dinner with Jerry and the other bunch of journalists. And Jerry Wilkinson said, you know, Mr. Hamani, this is very, very unusual. This, we've not done this before. So can you tell me a little bit about yourself? So I said, well, um, before WTN, I was at ABC News. Before that, I was with NBC. Before that, I was at CNN. And I got that job on, based on a very, very exaggerated CV. Be before that, I was in local television, CKVU, where I got fired. Um, before that, I was at BCAT, where I was a flunky. I never graduated. And before that, I worked illegally because of my age at an Egyptian-owned discotheque in Vancouver, which resembled more of a house of ill repute than a discotheque. And Jerry looked at me, and his face kind of his mouth dropped and said, I'm so glad I didn't ask you this yesterday. <laughs> but the interview went very well, and I think a film came out that was, was quite good. <laughs> Amazing. Um, so... Moving forward slightly, uh, you were involved in the Golden Jubilee film uh, and the homage ceremony. So what was that like to put that together? Well, working on the homage ceremony was, was almost as, as stressful as the war in Bosnia in so many ways. Sometimes dealing with bureaucracy and sometimes dealing with and getting decisions in time and, and the deadlines that are unrealistic and all that. It was very stressful. I went gray in the three weeks that I sort of stayed up all night. But they were really amazing opportunities. Again, it was Dick Blystorm from CNN who wrote the script for Our Imam, Our Times and did an amazing job, you know, in, in a very, very short time. And for the homemade ceremony, um, it was Navarro's time and I was in Jamaat Khanna and I heard an announcement that, that the homemade ceremony message of Malan Azram is, is going to be sent by satellite around the world. And my first instinct as a provider was, oh my God, they've got another provider, you know, and we do satellites for a living. What's going on? So I called my colleagues at Eglamo and Shahid Karim being one of them and said, what's going on? He said, I don't know, but we're hearing also now these are the plans. So there's nothing like set in stone. So there were some meetings at, um, in, in Paris anyway, in France. And so we went and we sat down and the order was, the, the, the request was not the order, but the idea was that we would bring the ceremony same day to almost 1,100 down Ismaili centers, Jamaat Khanna's uh, community, just 1,100 places around the world. Afghanistan, Pakistan, Zambia, Rwanda, Vancouver, you know, so whatever. So then uh, we said, how is it going to be done? So I talked to Glowcast and I talked to different companies who do satellites and distribution and I said, we can't do it. First of all, there's no time. Tour de France and all these events are up there. And second of all, normally we do the satellite and then TV stations pick it up and they distribute it. So how do we do this? So now I'm struggling with this Our Imam, Our Times, which is completely behind schedule. And now suddenly I've got this new thing that, that we need to sort out. So while I'm thinking about this, I'm walking to the office in London and I see Mark Slaughter, angel number Y, uh, who's sitting having a coffee in the coffee shop just underneath our office. And I go to say, hey, Mark, you know, good to see you. What are you doing? He says, oh, uh, I'm looking for a job. And I knew that he had been involved in satellites and in, in distribution and fibers and all the rest of it. I said, you're just the guy, you're free? He says, yes. So I just grabbed him, paid for his coffee, went up to the office and said, this is what we need to do. And he looks at it and he says, I think we can do it. because." And he knew remote and obscure satellites that we'd never even heard of. So we needed eight satellites and three fibers to do that with, with, with figures costing, I wouldn't even venture to, to give you the amount, unlike the technology today. And that had to be done. And Mark Slaughter, the guardian angel, pulled it off amazingly, not by himself, but with thousands and hundreds of volunteers around the world. Because even just Pakistan at 550 drops, India at 200 and something, but we reached every single country that time successfully because they had volunteers all over the world who were able to take down the, these feeds and then transmit it to the Jamaats worldwide. Um, and again, even while this was going on, we, we had technical problems at Eglamo. Uh, we turned their car park into like a rock, rock group, like rock concert with all these satellite cars and trucks and things and God knows what. 
but, but we had technical problems and we were delayed and delayed and delayed. And to the extent where we could not extend the satellites anymore, we'd extended them by six hours. And the last picture that went out, went out 15 minutes before the satellites started coming down. So there was a sigh of relief that actually we made it. Well, that was definitely a, a fantastic achievement. So well done to everyone involved in that. Um, so just bringing us, I guess, right up until uh, the most recent work that you've been doing, um, you've worked on a few projects with uh, Prince Ali Mohammed. So could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, we've worked on uh, two or three projects with him since uh, 2017. And uh, again, it was something that just comes to me. I feel like I'm a very privileged person. I'm a very lucky person. Good luck comes to me. Guardian angels come to me. Work comes to me. Well, I'll tell you the story before you even go into these pictures, but this is in Northern Pakistan and he's, he's flying a drone. So basically it was a phone call. I was in Manila at the time and I was on another assignment uh, for the Rice Research Institute. And uh, there was a conference call. And Prince Ali was very clear. He says, look, um, I'm very passionate about films. I'm, uh, there are subjects that are very important to me. And I would like to make films that, that, that I can get people to get involved and interested. He says, I've seen your work. It's very good. I'm really happy with the work you've done. But unfortunately, it does not speak to my generation. It does not speak to the 17 to 25 year old. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to make the films, but I'd like you to help me get there. So I said, fine. So um, our relationship then became me as a mentor, but Prince Ali Mohammed as a boss, because he was a director. And working with him in Pakistan, and then later on in Alchemia, the latest film that we made with him was quite an experience. Uh, he is extremely passionate about film. He knows more about film than 10 of us put together at any given time. Even in some of the, some of the, like during the, before the alchemia, he gave us homework, watch this series, watch this documentary series, watch how they deal with the archives, watch how they deal with the framing, what, look at the, the, the role of music. So um, I learned a lot from him. It was the other way around because of new way of doing things and the new outlook and he worked with younger members of staff like Soraya and the editors and all that. And, and they would be completely from a different angle. And sometimes he would even, he would even joke with me because I would say, no, this can happen. And he looks at me and says, look, you're from a news background. That may be working for news. It doesn't work for film. <laughs> so, so he was that hands-on, that particular, that everything about film. And it was a pretty punishing schedule. Like we'd start off at seven in the morning, eight in the morning. For, for somebody that young, he put in a lot of effort. We would leave seven, eight in the morning, not even come back for lunch or whatever, um, come back to the, to the base at 4.35, have an hour's break, and then, then straight away we'd have a meeting, we'd go through the rushes for the day, we would then continue meeting over dinner, we would plan the next day's operation until 10 or 11 at night, and then the thing would go on. Also watching him work with the passion that he has. I know that, for example, in Northern Pakistan, he was so passionate and compassionate at the same time. There was instances when we were filming in somebody's home and I kept moving them around because I wanted the women in the picture and I wanted to, to hide some of the stuff that was behind. And he got a little firm and said, look, we don't want to trouble them. And I had to explain to say, look, we need that for the shot. And then, and then I explained to the ladies that the reason we were moving them around because we want them in the shot rather than out of the shot. And that worked. Another interview we were doing was um, again in Northern Pakistan and it was very, very, very cold. And we were trying to get this interview with this lady and Prince Ali could see that she was cold. And he asked a few questions. We didn't get quite the answers we wanted. Then I was asked, left to ask the questions and I was not getting the answers and he got like very firm with me again and says okay last question because he did not want to see her suffer in the cold just because we wanted the answer in a particular way so I, I come from a news background it's harsher he comes from I look at the news story and the outcome and he looks at people and that's the, exactly the way he worked this thing is in the filming of Alchemia where he more or less produced every every shot every framing every bit in the set this is the crew we worked with in cairo it was a wonderful assignment full of challenges full of challenges but it was really really wonderful and i hope that through his films that he can galvanize young people to get interested and get involved in um, in what the messages is trying to portray climate change restoration education 
That's amazing. Thank you so much, Faridun, for sharing your fascinating stories with us. Um, what incredible experiences you've had. Um, so we've had a few questions come through. Um, so I guess if that's okay, we'll, we'll, we can get stuck into those. Sure. So the first question is, uh, what was the most transformational experience in your journalism career? I think the most uh, intense was my whole thing in uh, former Yugoslavia and Bosnia in particular. I think that changed in so many ways. It changed for me the way we worked. It brought people together. You had emotions going down and up and down and up. And one day you were thrilled and one day you were depressed and one day you were hungry and one day you were not. Uh, but it also brought into perspective things that are important in your life, you know? Um, so that was a transformational thing also. And, and, and when I left WTN, I left WTN because they were trying to do things that were not very nice to staff and lay people off who'd, who'd, uh, who'd um, risked their lives for years and all that. And on principle, I just could not accept that. And all that understanding came because of my experience in, in, in the Balkans generally. Yes, and on a similar line, I mean, uh, we have a question here that says, most of us can't comprehend the life uh, that you and your colleagues live and, and the dangers that you face. So could you try and describe to us what goes on in your mind um, that makes you firstly want to go into those, situa those situations? And secondly, to, you know, what makes that extra shot or, or that footage uh, worth it? First of all, I think it was youth that makes you sort of feel invincible that it can't happen to me. And there were so many instances in Sarajevo, especially even in the early days, you come back from an assignment and you found your colleague had been killed or wounded, or you're waiting to see who's coming in because you never knew who was gonna come back. Um, as a journalist, I wanted to be where history was being made, where the events were happening. It so happened those two decades were some amazing stories and I just had to be there. So, so there was no there was no question um you know it, it was just one of those where if you're not there you're missing out and thirdly you're prepared for it mentally you know that you're going into the in in harm's way that something may happen the the the, the bad thing about that was you know what he's doing to your families what he was doing to natasha what he was doing to my mom what he was doing to the other family who cares about you you know um, but you had to make the decision, and I, and I chose to go into this kind of conflict places. What sees me through is, in many ways, my faith. When I was in hospital in, uh, in Sarajevo, I had, like I said, Prince Azuddin's Tasbi, so I could say the Salawat, I could, I could uh, just, just like remembrance, zikr or whatever, and I had the BBC World Service. And those are the two things that kept me going at all given times. And the rest of it was just faith that, okay, it'll work out whatever it has to be. It's not pleasant, but you knew that you were voluntarily putting yourself in a position. Nobody forced you to go into there. And that helps. So the next question is, could you share more about the experience of interviewing uh, Alana Hazri Mom? Um, could you share a bit about your mindset as you went in? I had to switch off being Ismaili to being a, a, a professional journalist, not a professional Ismaili. Um, I, I was nervous because uh, I'm addressing the Imam, but as his highness, uh, I'm, uh, I'm interviewing somebody who's, who knows more about architecture than anybody else in the world that I know. And I'm the one who knows as little about architecture <laughs> than anybody else I know. So, but what, because I'm a professional uh, and I went into a professional thing, I had to keep that thing to say, this is an interview, this is for a story. And that was it. And, and, um, and of course, everybody is respectful, even the crew, to all, not just to Hazri Mam, but to all interviewees, and you have a decor and so on. Decor. So, were there any moments where you were moved to tears? Former Yugoslavia, yes. And sometimes, sometimes it's the frustration that you feel helpless when you know that you're trying so hard to keep the story in the news. Western countries, America, UK, everybody, they all paid lip service, but nobody actually wanted to get involved. And they were very happy to see the Bosnia story off the airwaves. And people like Christian Amanpour and all these people, they did an incredible job keeping the story alive and eventually galvanizing the West to come to the aid of, of, of the Bosnians. 
a lot of the times it was not even the war itself, but it was, it was um, when we were in the hospital and you're waiting there and you, you sometimes you had to put your cameras down and you, you drove people to the hospital like you saw in the clip that there was no ambulances or anything like that. And then waiting, just watching a family member being told that their son or their daughter has not made it and their dad and just those tears of anguish, a cry of anguish, you know. It's hard to take, especially when you feel low at the time. So those were moments um, that, that brought tears. But surprisingly, one other moment that brought tears was the mountains of Tajikistan. There were tears of joy. It was just amazing to look at. And it was just beautiful. So emotions. Well, there's actually, I don't know if you've seen it, there's actually a petition going on in, in the chat right now that uh, you should be writing a book <laughs> about your experiences. <laughs> so uh, there's a lot of people who would buy, who would, you know, be supportive and, and buy that book. So uh, you better get started on, on that. <laughs> as you're it's easy to, but anybody in our viewers, if they're writers and they want to collaborate with me, that'd be, that'd be fantastic. <laughs> uh, would you like to say a few words to close? First of all, I'm so delighted to see my new friends and my old friends. And I can see Jacqueline uh, on my screen right now. So, so good to see George Orr. He was my classmate at BCIT in the 70s and CKVU partner. And, I'm just delighted. I'm so pleased with, with, with the, the response I've had. Um, and hopefully it has been of use to the, to the youth at whom this was also aimed. But if, if, if I need to give any kind of summary for, for the viewers, particularly the youth, um, it is that don't let anybody tell you that you cannot follow your passion. They tried to do that for me, uh, to, to me in, at CKV, at um, BCIT. And somehow I believe that that's what I was meant to do and I did it. It didn't matter who told me what. Take chances in life. You don't have to take the kind of physical risk that I took or the business risk, but take opportunities. When they come, they come. So don't be afraid of losing. I've, I've told you all the success stories about how I overcame, but there were, there were at least twice as many of my failed projects and failed trips and, and, and all of that that didn't work out, you know? I just think humility is part of the thing. Take these things as gifts. Your guardian angels will come and they come and they come as gifts. It's not your right. Your opportunities will come. It's not your right. Don't feel entitled. Just accept them as gifts. And kindness. My world changed again in Prague when I was covering for uh, the Czechoslovak revolution. And um, it was very cold. It was miserable. And we had a very low budget and we had only one little... Skoda car and a French crew that was grumpy a lot of the times and no space and you know all of that. And it was a really bad, um, bad weather. And there was a press conference called by Václav Havel and Alexander Dubček, and they were the opposition leaders at the time of the revolution. And this lady came to me and said, uh, look, if we go to the press conference, can you please give me a ride? And I said, look, we've got no room in the car with all of this. And she looked, sort of disappointed. I said, no, no, we'll find a way. We'll find a way. So we gave her a ride. And that's it. Two days later, things like looking like they were quiet. I coming out of the hotel and I see her running towards me. She says, oh, I'm so happy to see you. I'm so happy to see you. And I said, what's the matter? What's happened? She says, look, I work for the New York Times. Um, this was pre-internet days, pre-mobile pre phone days, pre-any days. And she says, I know the prime minister is going to resign tonight but it'll be too late for my story tomorrow. So I'd like you to have the scoop, do what you want with it, but I can guarantee you the story is true. So I did my research. I called up people. I found angels at the prime minister's office. And in the end, I, I got into the prime minister's spokesperson, especially with a security guard pulling me and saying, who's Mr. Hermani? Come with me. <laughs> and I got the, the, the story, the confirmation, and I was the first to feed it out to the world that, that the government was falling. You know? And that because of a small, very, very small act of kindness that I gave somebody a ride. So be kind where you can, it will find you. That kindness will find you. That's my words of wisdom. Yeah, definitely great words of wisdom there. Thank you so much, uh, Faridun, from, for, for, for sharing your journey with us, taking the time uh, to be with us today and for giving us a huge amount of insight into the effort and the courage that it takes to get the images, the footage and the stories that we see every day on the news and in films and documentaries. Um, so thank you so much.